Thank you very much. I'd, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers of this conference for having me here. It's been a, a deep pleasure and, and an honor to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about two different yet related topics that I've been working on in the past few years. They have to do with um, electron-driven processes in the, in, in the chemical physics uh, field and also biological physics. But before I even uh, get into the talk itself, I'd like to sh tell you a little bit about basic time scales, the basic time scales involved in these processes. Here we have, if we talk about electron-driven processes first, yeah, so we imagine that those, those processes as collision of low energy electrons with a target molecule, very uh, broadly speaking, we could divide those into two categories. We can talk about fast electron collisions, which take place in about a tenth of a femtosecond, and we can talk about uh, recent electron collisions. Those uh, are commensurate with a period of molecular vibration. They take approximately 10 femtoseconds to, to occur. When we talk about, bio, about biological processes, for instance, vision, photosynthesis, molecular dynamic simulations, we're talking about uh, nanoseconds. If instead, enzymatic, if instead we think about enzymatic and regulatory processes, then we, we're dealing with, a, with microseconds and protein folding, structural reorganizations, for instance, take seconds, hours, sometimes even days. So we're talking about very different time scales here. And what can theory pr uh, help us predict? Well, uh, I'm going to try to show you throughout this talk that molecules can form temporary negative ion states by capturing a low energy electron, and that these uh, temporary anion states, which we call resonances, can enhance by several orders of magnitude the probability of certain reactions. It can also lead to distortions of polyatomic molecules that are necessary for reactions to occur. I'm also going to show you how the mechanisms by which proteins bind metal ions, for instance, may lead to the disruption of strictures that are associated with disease. So let's talk about electronic collisions first. Why are we interested in them? Well, all around us, electronic collisions drive a multitude of common physical devices and chemical changes. And that's what, and, and why is this? Well, because the electronic collisions are uniquely effective in transferring energy into the electronic degrees of freedoms of atoms and molecules. And that's what makes certain phenomena, such as um, modern fluorescent lighting, so energy efficient nowadays, and it also makes possible the plasma etching of seven conductors. But what I'm personally more interested in has to do with radiation damage of live tissue, of biomolecules. And why is that? Because for a very long time, scientists believed that the main radiation damage was due to this primary ionizing event that went through tissue and, and therefore produced most of the damage. But it was uh, very recently known that, discovered experimentally, that it is not that, but instead a large number of secondary electrons, which are low in energy, but can form these temporary negative states, these resonance states that will then lead to single and double strand breaks in DNA, for instance. So there is, uh, there are many, there are the, the mechanisms that the electron driven processes hinge on the mechanisms by which electronic energy is transferred into nuclear motion to produce reactive species by excitation and or fragmentation. So let's talk about these resonances for a, a little bit more. Uh, how, to, how are they produced? Well, this uh, picture you see here is a, well, it's a pictorial representation of a molecule. It's one of many molecules I studied. This is called ethylene. And what you see here is a representation of its orbitals. Now, you see an empty oral, a uh, sigma bond, antibody orbital there. A low energy electron can get trapped, can get captured into that empty molecular orbital. That's what we call a shape resonance. Alternatively, uh, the, this incident electron can excite electronic degrees of freedom of the, of the target molecule and attach to it. That has another name. That's called Feshbach resonance. Well, I already talked about what uh, time scales are involved in these resonances, and uh, shape resonance, for instance, are commensurate with the period of molecular vibration. And what we will see is that the multidimensional nuclear dynamics and polyatomics lead to new effects. What you see here are a bunch of curves, a bunch of, a bunch of wiggly curves, which we call, in, in, in this field, we call cross-sections. And what these curves represent are a 
a probability of a certain reaction to occur. Uh, what reaction are we talking about here? We're talking about a target molecule. In this particular case, it's nitric oxide, NO, and we have an electron colliding against nitric oxide and leaving that target molecule in, in, in different vibrationally excited states. So that's what these curves represent. Uh, the motivation of this calculation was because we had originally two sets of uh, experimental data, and there was a disagreement between this experimental data, and these calculations were good in the sense that it shed light onto which set of experimental results was more likely representing a more, giving a more accurate representation of the physical process itself. But this is not what I found more, more interesting. This is what motivated the calculation, but what I found more interesting was uh, the following. I decided I wanted to study, study dissociative attachment. What is dissociative attachment? It's another possible outcome. When we have this target molecule, we have a low energy electron in, in, uh, scattering off it, forming this temporary negative state, this temporary anion state. One possibility is that the molecule then fragments into two pieces, and one of those fragments takes away the electron with it. So that's what's represented here in that equation up there. You see, and this fragment is taking away the electron with it. That's called dissociative attachment. Now, this particular reaction that's represented up there is something that the experimentalists measure, and, and the results of that measurement is negligible. And it's not surprising. But what I found surprising is that if instead of st starting out the experiment with neutral, with, with nitric oxide in its ground vibrational state, we started the experiment, well, the calculation in my case, with vibrationally excited nitric oxide. Well, the cross sections, this probability, increases a thousandfold. And so this was very exciting because it stimulated a new uh, experiment at the Berkeley lab that is currently being performed. And so with time, we'll know, once they complete this experiment, whether this prediction uh, led to uh, something that can, they can now measure. And right? so this, this kind of... Um, Prediction power is something that's always very engaging to, to uh, people who do theory like myself. This is another aspect of uh, these calculations. I got, started getting more and more curious about um, biological molecules, and I decided to study this very, very simple uh, molecule, which is formic acid. Uh, for this molecule, this is a dissociative attach attachment reaction. Again, the scattering electron comes, sticks around the molecule for a while, and then the molecule breaks up in two fragments, and one of the fragments takes away the electron with it. And so this, I said, well, this is simple enough to study. I believe that what's going to happen here is we're going to get this shape resonance, and then the uh, hydrogen is going to pop off. Well, I started doing this calculation. I realized that that was not the case. And what was puzzling about this is the following. Both the target molecule and the fragments are planar. And so I was doing these calculations expecting to have the intermediate state, this uh, transient state, to be planar as well. However, after much trial and error, I realized that if I pulled these, high, this, these oxygen atoms and then I took the hydrogen out of plane, that, uh, that enabled this hydrogen to pop off, right? So we had to go beyond what was intuitive for us which was to keep everything planar. So this is just one pathway I, I found for this phenomenon to occur. There could be many more, right? And so this is where creativity comes into place. This is open to creativity because we, uh, what, what we discovered by doing this is that there are intrinsically polyatomic dissociation dynamics here, some sort of a hidden dynamic, except that it's uh, not uh, hidden to us, at least, because we need to understand uh, how these dynamics occur, but even in a simple small molecule like this, we can see that we cannot use the simple 1D models that have been used until, until present uh, time because, uh, because the reality of it is, is much more complex than, than we imagined. Um, now I'm going to briefly tell you about the uh, biological physics that are between the Department of Davis the Department of Physics at UC Davis. Here you see a list of neurodegenerative diseases with associated proteins. Um, there are several similarities between these uh, diseases, and uh, shedding light on one may well um, uh, be very informative to, to understanding uh, other diseases as well. So I'm going to focus on the prion protein, which is a protein we studied more deeply at UC Davis, which is the one associated with the Crutchfield-Jacob disease. That's a, a human version of a mad cow disease. 
So before I do so, because I know that this is a very general audience, I put together this slide to explain what are pro proteins and how proteins are constructed. Well, pretty much um, having Italian blood in me, I need my hands, and so this is difficult, this is challenging for me to use this microphone right now. But can you hear me if I speak loudly? Excellent. So, uh, um, how, do, how are molecules, how are proteins formed? We have amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of proteins, right? And so, uh, but what is an amino acid? An amino acid is a simple structure, it's a chemical structure that looks pretty much like this, right? It has a central carbon here, which we call the alpha carbon. It has an amine group sticking out from one side, a, a, a carboxyl group on the other side. It has a hydrogen atom here, and this R here represents a chain of atoms. It could be a simple, as simple as a single hydrogen, it could be a whole chain, a more complex chain. The only difference between one amino acid and the next is this R, this, R, this chain here. So how do they get together to form uh, proteins? Well, they form what, uh, they undergo what is called a dehydration reaction because they liberate a molecule of water in the process. This uh, carboxyl group combines with the amine group and then they form a chain. Now, this here is a protein. We have a chain of amino acids, we have a protein, right? But the, the protein is not a nice layout, straight structure in space. Instead, it folds up, it curls up in space, and they form uh, structures, which are called secondary structures, that could look, look like this strap that's looped around here. This is called a half a helix, or it could form, form sheet-like structures that could be parallel or anti-parallel. These are beta sheets, and I need this to, uh, there are more, but these are the ones I need for the remainder of the talk. So what do we know about the prion protein? What we know is its primary structure. All, each letter here represents one amino acid, this one letter code here. We know part of its secondary structure. We know it has uh, beta, beta, two beta sheets. We know it has alpha helices, the ones represented here and up here. We also know that they bind copper. Now, why is this binding of copper even important? Well, because it is believed that it is the breakdown of, of metal homeostasis and metal equilibrium, which is the key factor in many of these neurodegenerative diseases, right? And so there is much debate whether binding copper is going to be neuroprotective or neurodegenerative, meaning whether it's going to trigger the disease or it's going to inhibit the disease. So this motivated the study. And what have we found at UC Davis? Well, something everybody needs to know is that everybody has prion protein in the brain, yes? We all have prion proteins. If you're not sick, it means you have a healthy form of the prion protein, right? Now, the only difference between healthy prion protein and diseased prion protein is its conformation. It's the way it folds up in space, right? So over here, we have a, a representation of what healthy prion protein looks like, the way it folds up in space. This is what diseased prion protein looks like. Now, what, what we found at UC Davis is that if you look at these two binding motifs of copper, in order to bind copper, the prion protein needs to bend around the copper. It needs to acquire a bent structure that is not consistent with the straight structure that you see here that is necessary for this diseased form of prion protein. So that's an indicator that binding copper can be neuroprotective. Now, I have studied segments that are known experimentally not to bind copper. So I've studied the binding property of copper in these segments. The fact that they do not bind copper experimentally is not surprising. Why is that? Because of the alpha, but because those segments I'm studying are within this alpha structure, right? Alpha helical structure. However, if this alpha helices can be, are disrupted, for instance, by lowering the pH of the environment, that is something that could happen during neuron, neuron synapses, for instance, at that stage, then, it is possible for this to bind copper and therefore follow a path that's different than refolding into a disease structure. So that was a little bit the, motiva the, the motivation of studying this. What did I do? Well, I constructed a candidate structure, and I uh, studied the, the I made an, est an estimate of the energy of binding. And uh, in a very simple model, right? I have the energy of, a, I'd say the energy of binding is the energy of a complex, which is the whole thing, minus the energy of the fragments, yeah? Here's the copper and some water uh, molecules coordinating that, and here's the rest of the prion. So, 
when I started running calculations here, the typical calculations that one runs is molecular dynamic simulations for these large bio, uh, biomolecules. And I found that uh, even in, within those fragments that are experimentally known to bind copper, molecular dynamic simulations do not reflect that. Okay? And there's a, the reasons for that to happen because you need to use more approximate methods than, uh, to, to, in order to describe these huge molecules. If I do quantum mechanical calculations on these proteins, the energy of binding is um, physically large. And there are reasons for this as well. I don't want to get too technical here. But uh, what I, I came up with is say, okay, I'm going to embed quantum mechanical calculations within the molecular dynamic simulations and see what happens then. And what happens then, and I'm going to skip this because of lack of time, uh, what happened there then is that we found that the energy of binding of these, uh, th these um, fragments are within reason, and they're even larger than uh, the fragments, the binding of fragments that are uh, measured experimentally to bind copper. And so I ran other, other tests as well to measure the affinity of different metals and thus follow experimental trends. There are many results issue, unresolved issues, so there's lots of room to create and, and, and to contribute.